primary reasons that comic books are such a fascinating medium is that they are an expanded universe. There are so many variations or retellings of the same story. This gives many artists more freedom than in other mediums. They can take risks or try out a character trait for a few issues, and if it doesn't work, it can be erased. Because of this, all comic book characters exist on an ever-changing spectrum that evolve with time and social progress. As comic books become more and more mainstream, a trend driven mainly by their film adaptions, audiences are now ready for stories that are closer to the source material. This means that more characters will get well-deserved screen time and that more complex relationships between characters can be observed. Today I will be talking about three DC bad girls who represent fully developed female characters who have either never been used on film or have been dreadfully underused in their portrayals. Now if I'm going to talk about comic books and feminism, there are two subjects I feel obligated to comment on. The first of which is the women in refrigerators. For those of you who are not familiar with the term, it was coined by Gail Simone, a comic book writer in 1994, in response to Green Lantern's issue number 54. In this issue, written by Ron Mars, the current Green Lantern girlfriend, Alex DeWitt, was killed by supervillain Major Force and was, as the name suggests, literally stuffed into a refrigerator. Kyle Rayner was one of the least liked characters ever to wear the ring, and Alex's death became the pinnacle of his storyline. The term has now come to mean any female character that has been killed, maimed, or disempowered in order to further a male character's storyline. The male equivalent of this term is dead men defrosting, in which a male character is killed, maimed, or disempowered, then later has a chance to return to his more heroic state. I definitely agree that this is a problem, and it is a problem so embedded in our culture that it is often hard to recognize. This stems from the view that women are weaker than men, and therefore easier to disempower, as well as an anxiety about female power. However, when a death or maiming occurs in a comic book, it must be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. The death of Jean Grey, or Phoenix from the X-Men comics, served a point beyond the effect on her surrounding characters and completed her character arc in a poignant and honest way. Furthermore, the transformation of Barbara Gordon from Batgirl to Oracle after she was paralyzed by the Joker adds to her badassery, in my opinion. Bottom line, let's keep our characters out of the refrigerator and make sure that their story arcs remain true to their character rather than becoming a sounding board for another. It happens way too much in media and is often misogynistic. Number two, sexualization through costuming. Superhero costumes are by nature skin tight. Look at the muscles or bulge on Superman and Batman. Female costumes tend to fall into the realm of, well, how could I put this, uncomfortable and inefficient. However, if a costume does indeed match the character's expression of sexuality, I do not have a problem with it. Catwoman, Starfire, and Black Canary are examples of characters whose sexuality is intrinsic to themselves. While some of their costuming may seem outrageous, they are characters who use their bodies to their advantage and own it as empowerment. However, the recent redesigns of Raven and Harley Quinn were clearly catering to fan service and have little to no basis in their characterization. In other words, costuming is just that, a costume, unless it becomes distracting to their story arcs. Then it is simply in poor taste. Okay, now to my countdown. As I said before, these are all DC girls, meaning they fall into one of two famous comic book canons. Now, the reason I didn't include any Marvel ladies in my analysis is that as a reader, I prefer DC, and I didn't think I was well-versed enough in their lore to truly do any of the characters justice. Anyway, number three, Talia al Ghul. Since first appearing in Detective Comics number 411, this eco-terrorist has been one of the most important members of the Batman villain gallery. The daughter of fellow supervillain Ra's al Ghul, she's a bad girl with a cause, following in her father's footsteps to rid the world of a disease that just happens to be humanity. Talia is not only the leader of the League of Assassins, but is also Batman's equal in every way. She is intelligent, a proficient fighter, and a genius-level strategist. She is also the mother of Batman's child, Damian Wayne, who defies her to become the fifth Robin in the New 52. I find it interesting that in nearly all film adaptions, her relationship with Bruce Wayne has been omitted in favor of a romance with Selina Kyle, aka Catwoman. Yet it is a vital part of Batman's development in nearly all comic book canon. Why is it that she has been excluded or underused in the cinematic Batman story? I think it is because of the complexity of their relationship. While Talia is technically a morally ambiguous character, many of her choices are not conducive to her position as a love interest. Selina Kyle is an amazing character. She's the clever half to Bruce's intellect, the street smarts behind his detective work. Yet in her position as chaotic neutral, she almost always finds it lucrative to side with or have a soft spot for the Dark Knight. 
Batalia has saved Bruce Wayne's life on countless occasions. She's also so devoted to her cause that she cares more about it than she does about him. Her choices are much darker than her feline counterpart, the darkest of which include engineering the death of her child, a casualty of a much bigger operation to defeat Batman once and for all. It cannot be denied that this is also an expression of her disappointment at Damien's life choices. Her convictions are to herself. She may be conflicted at times, but she is nearly always true to her goal. Talia did make an appearance in Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight Rises. However, she was criminally underused and her background story was not intact. A character does not have to be good in order to be a compelling, complete character, and the addition of Talia al Ghul could be proof of that. Now, on to my number two. The Amazing Amanda Waller. This character is awesome. She stands out in a sea of whitewashed, traditionally beautiful characters and totally owns it. She first appeared in Legends No. 1 back in 1986 under the alias of The Wall and the White Queen. Since then, she has participated in and run two separate super organizations, between her work as a federal agent in Checkmate and her formation and direction of the Suicide Squad, as well as Argos, the creators of Justice League of America in the New 52, she has proved over and over again that she's a more than competent leader and a powerful force in the DC Universe. She is also an African-American character with a curvy build who does not hide her body in shame, and her confidence is something to be admired. I personally do not like her new glamorous redesign, where she is about half the size as she was before. I think that Waller is at her best when she is big, as she stands in contrast to her peers and provides visibility for more than one body type, one of the biggest problems I find in comic books. She was also portrayed in her skinnier form by Angela Bassett in the 2011 Green Lantern film, again to horrible under usage. She has also made appearances in both Smallville and the animated show Justice League Unlimited. Yet I want more. She represents a character that is so underappreciated, and my hopes are high to see a big, beautiful Amanda Waller in the upcoming live-action Justice League film. And now, to my favorite comic book character of all time. My number one bad girl is Harley Quinn. Now, many people are surprised to hear this, as she was created solely for the purpose of supporting a male character, that man's arch enemy, the Joker. First appearing as a one-time cameo on Batman the Animated Series, audiences liked her so much that she now not only is a crowd favorite, but has appeared in numerous comics and now has her own title. The Joker and Harley have always had a physically and emotionally abusive relationship, yet their shared sadistic and masochistic tendencies always seem to draw them back together. So why do I, a self-proclaimed feminist, love a character whose primary arc is dependence on a masculine figure? because she is a fascinating character who has broken the mold she was initially built from in order to become a unique, autonomous being. She represents development in comics, and shows us that there is more than one way to be a strong female character. First off, she is genuinely funny without being misogynistic. She is far more than the girl who purrs a sassy line as she kicks ass, which definitely has its place, but has been overused in my book. She is silly, not sexy, and it's miraculously refreshing. She also has an extremely strong and rare friendship with fellow bad girl Poison Ivy, who she affectionately calls Red. Even though her own title has illustrated that she may not really be a team player, her love of her friend has been consistent throughout her portrayals and gives us a unique look at a healthy, supportive female friendship, even if their motives may be less than honorable. One critique that has been issued for Harley again and again is her apparent lack of intelligence. However, her ditzy blonde persona has now been debated since her origin story was revealed. Based on the fact that she was formerly a psychiatrist, many fans actually believe that she is smarter than she appears, and I am definitely in this camp. Her new comic helped reaffirm this belief and made me fall in love with the character even more than I had before. Before she was Harley Quinn, she was Dr. Harleen Quinzel, a psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum who treated the Joker, eventually falling in love with him and joining him in his life of crime. What her new comic confirms is that Harleen did indeed work for everything she had. Coming from a poor family, rife with mental illness, she worked twice as hard to be taken seriously, focusing on school as an outlet for her frustration, unlike in other versions in which she used her feminine wiles to get through medical school. Her entire life was about control before she met the Joker. He introduced her to his psychosis, and while the fantasy world he lives in is sick and twisted, it was also intriguing. When Harleen began to experiment with her new identity, she found it liberating, fully giving herself over to the illusion and actively disassociating herself from the world around her. In this new incarnation, Harleen still exists within Harley and psychoanalyzes herself on a regular basis, officially diagnosing herself as having disassociative personality disorder. Not only is this a cool way to explore the inner dialogue of an altered mind, but it also gives layers to a character that started off as a clown. 
On a darker note, I feel I need to address the recent Harley Quinn drawing contest scandal. Earlier this year, DC Comics put out an advertisement for a new artist contest. They described panels from the new Harley Quinn comic that specified her attempting suicide using various methods while in various states of undress. I understand what DC was trying to do by exploring the self-destructive facets of Harleen's personality. However, that is no excuse for sexualizing her mental illness, which has also come up in her recent redesign and story arts. Believe it or not, I think it is entirely possible to allow her to be a sexually active character without exploiting that aspect of herself. It is simply a matter of sensitivity in the framing of consent and agency. Well, that's my countdown. Thank you so much for watching. I would just like to point out before I go that all of the images in this video belong to their original owners, none of whom are me. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you didn't, I hope it at least made you think. Thank you, and goodbye. Hey.